Welcome back. This is part two of the 33-year-old cold case in the death of 17-year-old Tamworth teenager Mark Haynes. If you missed part one, you can find the link below. On January 16, 1988, when Mark's body was found on the train tracks, there were several odd items around the body. There was a towel underneath Mark's head. There was no mud on his clothes or shoes, despite mud surrounding the area. A stolen Tirana was found dumped a kilometre and a half south of the body next to the train tracks. The windscreen's popped out. The boot isn't open at the time, but the family went back and opened the boot, got the um, mat out, looked like it was um, soaked in blood, or there was blood on it, and he took it to the police. Oxley local area command detective sergeant Dallas Lamy attended the Tirana the day after Mark's body had been found. He didn't fingerprint it, saying that the rain from the night before would have washed away any fingerprints or forensic materials, even inside the car. The car was left to languish there for at least a month, according to Mark's family. The police admitted during the inquest that they initially didn't see the car as important. How important would that car be for you, if you were working that scene? Given my understanding of the location of where the car was and the railway line and so on, I think it was too much to be a chance or a coincidence. Um, the fact that it was near the railway line, it was out of the way a bit, it wasn't too far from where the body had been, uh, it's just too much to be a coincidence. The question is, though, who was driving the car? Police failed to fingerprint the car, take any, any material from it, I mean, was, and left it in the rain. Yeah. Um, look, I think that was um, uh, probably a poor decision. I understand that it was pouring rain that night, and one of the reasons given for not taking the fingerprints was that everything was wet. Now, I'm not sure whether the inside of the car the driving, the steering wheel, for example, the seats, the dashboard and all of that were wet or not, but I think it should still have been fingerprinted and so should any other property and even the inside door handles and so on been printed. It's not the only questionable decision the local police made in those first few hours after finding Mark's body. They also failed to take the towel that was underneath Mark's head. The towel raises numerous questions. Was it Mark's towel? Did someone place it under his head? Was it covered in blood? Could it have had the killer's DNA on it? Those questions will go forever unanswered because the first police on the scene failed to take it into evidence. At Mark's inquest, Constable Geyer was asked, assume that another person had been at the scene prior to yourself other than the deceased. Would it give the appearance that some person had placed the towel under the head of an injured person? Gaia told the inquest, it would give that appearance, yes. Would you have looked at that as some crucial evidence? I would be asking the question, why would a fellow like Mark be walking up the railway line with a towel? It's pouring rain. Very odd. It's very odd. And I think that goes back to the car. You'd say there's too much suspicion to ignore the car, so you have to do everything on the off chance that it might be a, in, have some involvement. And the same with the towel. We've got to work out why he's carrying, why he has the towel. What was it used for? What, how was he carrying it? Was it wrapped around his head? Did he, was he assaulted earlier? The meeting, organised by Tamworth Police between Mark's family and the two suspects, the neglect of the stolen car and the towel are all pointed to by the family as flaws in that initial investigation. Currently, the elite New South Wales State Crime Command's Homicide Squad have a team trying to establish whether the Oxley LAC investigations were bungled in any way. If they find evidence of that, they'll take the case on. That they're actually, we are actually getting a review from the State Crime Command. So that's what we've been asking for since November. Greens MP David Shoebridge, who was instrumental in getting the squad to look into the case, says justice should have been served by now. 
Could you imagine the uproar if a young, um, effervescent, sporty, engaged white kid, same age as, as Mark, um, had been found dead on a railway tracks in the in the circumstances that Mark was, you know, having allegedly stolen a car, turtled the car, picked up all these presents, walked up on an embankment, headed the wrong way, carried the presents, tiptoed over a bridge, and then decided to lie down on a train and to be struck by a train, and then turn up, you know, in this totally implausible situation with his head on a towel. And nobody would accept that a young white man would do that. No family would accept a police verdict that said a young white man had done that. The media wouldn't accept it. I doubt a coroner would accept it. I doubt the police would accept it. The constant struggle to get answers has seen Jack take matters into his own hands and offer his own hard-earned cash as a reward, tired of seeing his family being ignored by the justice system. I love to put $20,000 of my own money to any information or to lead up to arrest, you know, just uh, try and solve this mystery. Your name, I'm Your name. Uh, yeah, just to try and get answers so we can rest, get on with our lives. His mother and father, they died of a broken heart. It's unbelievable, especially when you can't get answers. It really rips the family apart. Without a doubt, the main reason I've spent the last four years investigating Mark's case is the staunchness of his family. We are not satisfied with any of your investigations. You never investigated nothing. Even when they felt ignored by the police and authorities, they always persisted. Steadfast in their belief that Mark was killed and placed on those train tracks. We all have probably got the same common goal in that we want closure, we want justice. For Craig Craigie, Mark was more like a little brother rather than a nephew. The two were very close in age. They'll be forever linked by the 16th of January. I remember coming home and he was sitting at the front of uh, uh, Barb's place, which was 75 Water Road. Um, and I had all intentions to say to him, jump in the car, come down for the weekend, which he would have, and we'll be back uh, Sunday night. And because I was in a bit of a puff, I went in the house and grabbed my bag and waved goodbye and, and left. Today, Craig has a son the same age as Mark. Watching his son mature into a man has led to questions about what type of person Mark would have become. 17, being able to actually see a 17 year old at probably the start or prime of their life. Mm -hmm. To be thinking that suddenly that someone at that age would lose their life and all the potential that they could get or get out of life. Yeah. And I think he would have made a great, great man, a great father. I've travelled to Coffs Harbour where Craig now lives to show him the documents I've obtained regarding Mark's death. I've never really seen the written documents, but mm. see all those statements after probably, what, 29 years? Because a lot of it that I'd sort of got second-hand or third-hand, yeah, it's good to read it, actually, and just get the factual stuff. Yeah. The documents, which include witness statements given to the police and the Mr X and Mr Y transcript, are a revelation for Craig. In his mind, it's a solid confirmation that his family's criticism of the initial police investigation is justified. And they also support his theory that Mark was assaulted before he died. Something happened that he got hurt. It was just, I think it was an encounter. I come across Mark by chance, went, a bit of beef, yeah. okay, something's happened. Yes. Probably got in a, a scuffle, fight, maybe hit his head and thought, well, mm. he's dead, let's We've got to do something. Yeah, covered it up.
The coronial inquest into Mark's death began on the 19th of October 1988. The inquest would sit twice and the coroner would return open findings. Simply put, that means he could not determine if Mark had been killed or had died by his own misadventure. One of the key witnesses to appear at the inquest was Dr Thomas Oatley. Dr Oatley, the then New South Wales Director of Forensic Medicine, performed a second autopsy on Mark after the family were unsatisfied with a post-mortem done by the local GP. He found the cause of death was a head injury. In his findings, he points to two distinct head injuries. One is called an extradural haemorrhage and the other is called a subdural haemorrhage, also known as a subdural haematoma. Dr Oatley died last year, so we can't ask him about his testimony or the post-mortem he performed on Mark. He kind of gets confused, but... but so I've approached respected forensic pathologist Dr Johan de Flor to examine Dr Oatley's findings and all court documents relating to Mark's injuries for any sign of homicide in Mark's death. No, that wouldn't happen, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it doesn't make sense. Dr. De Flor performs thousands of autopsies a year and has appeared before countless coronial inquests. The New South Wales Coroner's Court routinely asks him to take on complex deaths. Emotional tributes flowed for the young batsman, a country kid who loved his farming and loved his cricket. Like that of cricketer Philip Hughes, who died in 2014 after being hit on the head by a cricket ball and provide a clear medical explanation of what is likely to have occurred. The head injury is unusual in this case for somebody who's been struck by a train. Um, it, effectively, what we've got is a large subdural hematoma. A subdural hematoma is a, an accumulation of blood over the surface of the brain. Um, it's certainly a very dangerous injury. Um, but you see that type of injury much more from falling, from being punched, sustaining blows to the head, as opposed to um, the result of train accidents. Dr DeFlore's observation gives weight to claims by several community members in 1988 that Mark had been bashed earlier in the night by a group of men before being placed on the train tracks. And in, in your experience, uh, this is caused by uh, normally a blow to the head or someone falling? Is this kind of, you know, hitting their head? Yes, look, um, the, the usual scenario is a movement of the head, typically as a result of falling, um, often with associated skull fracturing, but not always. Um, and it's the impact on the ground that causes the major damage to the brain. A subdural hematoma grows bigger over time if left untreated, eventually leading to death. Look, I, th I think it's fair to say that um, when it comes to the treatment of patients with subdural hematomas, um, it's important to treat that hematoma within four hours. Certainly as it gets bigger and bigger, you become unconscious and then you become comatose. And I think that's a major problem in this case, trying to explain the subdural hematoma. Mark's subdural hematoma was one centimetre in length, which Dr DeFlor says is quite large. And there was certainly enough time for Mark to develop an injury that size. Tanya White, Mark's girlfriend, told authorities that she said goodbye to him at 3.30 in the morning. His body was found at 6.30am, meaning there was a three-hour window where Mark could have received a serious blow to the head, which would have led to that deadly injury got to add them all together and then you go, gee, that's weird, yeah. you know. <laughs> the subdural haematoma is never discussed in Mark's inquest. Who knows what the coroner's findings might have been if Dr Oatley had explained to him that that injury is often only seen in assault victims. Straightforward pedestrian struck by a train who is killed by that train right then and there will not have this injury. It's a physical impossibility. So it must mean that something happened, if you were struck by a train at all, something must have happened prior to that and some period prior to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that's the central mystery of this case. The other mystery is where did Mark's blood go? 
Look, any laceration, and there, there's some good lacerations here, they're you know, a good size, um, you would expect them to bleed, and you'd expect them to bleed quite, quite extensively. Um, there should be a lot of blood around. Mark had several large and deep cuts on different parts of his body, and part of his scalp had been sliced off by the front of the train. Yet, there was only a blood spot around the size of a 50 cent coin near his body. Would you see this type of injury in a car crash at all? It really depends on the circumstances of the crash, um, but you can. There's some other aspects in relation to this as well. Mm. So there was skull fracturing. Associated with that was a limited amount of extradural bleeding. Now, so far we've talked about subdural bleeding, mm. which is bleeding um, between a thick membrane that covers the brain and the brain itself. Extradural blood is found between that covering, the dura mater, and the skull. And in this case, there was fracturing of the skull and there was limited extradural blood in association with that fracturing. So what it, that indicates to me, again, is that there's been survival between when the skull was fractured and the extradural blood accumulated. It, it makes you wonder, have some of the injuries at least been sustained in a different location? Was potentially, on the other hand, the deceased dead when he was struck by the train? You know, that certainly becomes a possibility. The question is, if Mark was attacked, when and where did it happen? Sifting through the cache of documents relating to the case, I came across a handwritten letter. The contents of that letter reveals a woman who may have heard Mark begging for his life on the night he died. So I presume they came up Bill Street, which is Bill Street. After a lot of cold calls, I found her, and she's agreed to share her recollection of that night. We've given her the name Brooke. I went to the police station. I remember my first words were, this might mean nothing at all, but I was very, very concerned for um, a young girl. You know, this young fella. On Saturday, January the 16th, 1988, between 3.20 and 3.30 a.m., Brooke heard a commotion outside her home. I was woken by um, a loud voices, um, which was coming straight through my bedroom window, and then I could hear this young voice, young fella, and I thought, oh, he was a mess. It was just like, lay me alone. Um, you know. F off, F off, leave me alone. It was so emotional that I was very, very concerned for him. And I thought, oh, well, there's two people having an argument, but I just hope nothing bad happens here. Left into Churchill Street. Right, went along here. At the time, Brooke lived on the T-junction of Bell Street yep. and Churchill Street, putting her house directly on the route taken by Mark and Tanya on his last night alive. I could hear the voices coming up here, but that car... Oh, kept coming up here. And Tanya told the inquest they walked up Bell Street and turned left into Churchill Street before saying goodbye at 3.30 a.m. Brooke says she heard an argument around the same time. So instead of hearing sort of an angry boy or someone that was really uh, angry, you, th you thought it was more of a distressing anger? I felt it was someone like just leave me alone, I've had enough, I can't take any more of it, rather than, you know, like sometimes you'll hear fights that go on and then they want to knock someone down or something like that. It wasn't like that. Brooke then tried to go back to sleep, but was abruptly awoken by the sound of a speeding car. I didn't think it was going to make the corner. I pictured it going into one of these houses, you know, I was waiting for the crash, the sound of the crash. She claims that the car came to a stop around the corner of Wilbertree and Edward Street, the spot where Tanya said goodbye to Mark before speeding off into the early morning. It pulled up long enough to do something for a few minutes and then it took off at a rapid speed. Did you have a gut feeling that something was going down? I mean, yeah. Or something bad was about to happen? I mean... Whatever happened on whatever that fight, this pulled up was connected to that. I thought, those couple, somebody's gone, pulled up, 
and picked these couple up and taken them somewhere. And of course, this is where Tanya said goodbye to Mark. Yes, that's right. And at 3.30, and you'd heard this car at 3.30. Yes. Tanya, in her inquest testimony, said that she and Mark never had an argument that night and says that he was in a good mood when she said goodbye to him. Brooke testified at Mark's inquest in 1988 about what she heard that night, and she claims police have not spoken to her since. Could that car that Brooke heard screeching to a halt be the stolen Tirana found crashed near Mark's body? There were other witnesses at Mark's inquest who claimed to have seen a car pulled up beside someone that night in the same location. Were they talking to Mark? Just in terms of why you want to come forward now, I guess, you know, or why you're giving the interview, or what are your mm. reasons now? Because, number one, there's a family out there that I would have to know in my heart that if it was me, I would never be able to rest or have peace, even though it's going to be devastating. But I'd say you, you just want to know the truth. Mark's family have always claimed that because he was an Aboriginal boy from Coaldale, his case never received the level of attention a non-Indigenous victim would have. Countless Aboriginal families across this country have similar stories to tell of alleged police mistreatment, particularly when we're talking about the 1980s and early 90s. And so these things are in living memory, that, that huge divide, that racial divide, um, was something that, were, that people w had lived through as part of their everyday life. Even today, there is a lot of tension between Aboriginal communities and the police in parts of Australia. But back in the 1980s, that kind of, t that kind of tension was the norm. Professor Larissa Barrent is a lawyer and academic who has worked with the families of three murdered Aboriginal children from the small Koori community of Barraville on the New South Wales north coast as they pursue justice. Four-year-old Evelyn Greenup, 16-year-old Clinton Speedy Duro and 16-year-old Colleen Walker were murdered between 1990 and 1991. Colleen's body has never been found and no one has ever been found guilty of their murders. Part of the research and investigation Yambana did um, and your team was also look at the media coverage of, say, the Barraville victims versus, say, non-Indigenous victims. What did you find in that? There's no doubt that the, there is a lot more sympathy towards victims of crime if they're not Aboriginal. And I think one of the things that was incredibly hurtful for the community um, in relation to these murders was not just that they weren't given the same empathy as victims of crime that they would have been if they were white, but there was a lot of suspicion about what was assumed to be their role in it. Over the past year, the Barraville families have been supported by the State Crime Command's Homicide Unit based in Sydney. They take on complex murders and have resources solely dedicated to solving them. I can't go into the evidence, you will all understand that. But what I can say is two young Australians lost their lives here and we need to make sure we're doing all we can to make sure that never happens again. How has uh, the State Crime Command coming on board opened up, you know, the possibilities for the family? I think one thing that we've found in Barraville that I think happens in a lot of other cases is that, is that once the system is put under the spotlight, rather than being reflective about what went wrong, what they do is try and tenaciously defend their opinion and their, their decisions and their actions. After intensive lobbying by Mark's family and New South Wales Greens MP David Shoebridge over the past 12 months, the State Crime Command have agreed to review local police investigations of Mark's case. If they find them unsatisfactory in any way, the unit will commence their own investigation. Mark's sister is hoping they do. She says the Tamworth police have not spoken to her once in 29 years. No one's talked to us about it. We haven't heard from the police. The only time we heard from the police was when Mark passed away. We haven't heard anything after that. They haven't kept in contact with us, which they should have been keeping in contact with Mum. It's like part of them died too. You know, you don't expect to go, you don't expect your kids to go before you. You expect to go before your kids. Lorna and her brother Ron say their mother and father died of a broken heart. They could never get over the death of their firstborn. 
They say the longer Mark's death remains unsolved, the more damage it does to the family, and they hope their anguish is not in vain. We were very close. We were a close family. He used to always keep in touch with us, ring us all the time. Typical big brother. He was there for his family. Someone does know something, please come forward. Four years ago, I flew into Tamworth and met Mark's uncle, Don Craigie, for the first time. I could never have envisioned the journey I would go on with Mark's family as they struggled to get answers. Last year, my reporting for BuzzFeed News saw Jessica come forward with the explosive claim that her son put Mark on the train tracks. This led to the case being reopened again. With my last breath, you know, I will still be looking to find out what has happened to Mark. I believe the police conducted a lax initial investigation, failing to see Mark's death as suspicious. I also believe they left crucial evidence at the crime scene and allowed Mark's grieving family to conduct their own inquiries. Every time I uh, went to them uh, and uh, I put in that many complaints and then the ombudsman keeps writing back, uh, wanting me to mitigate or whatever with, uh, with the police. I've done this over and over. It, it was like no matter uh, whatever I went to them with or whatever, they've always had an answer to justify why they weren't investigating. So they still seem to appear to have that same view that that um, his death was caused by his own doing, by misbehaviour. Over the years, there have been several subsequent investigations by the Tamworth police, but they've all fizzled out, and for 29 years, the family say they've pretty much been ignored. Police never inform them about anything. Like, more or less, me and my brother Donald, uh, uh, we sort of done our own investigation because we knew it wasn't right. So, you know, it's just more and more we try and dig into the truth, you know, the more and more, you know, you know, things, strange things happen. Everything I've read and heard points to Mark being killed and his family want authorities to know that Mark's life mattered, that all Aboriginal lives matter. Everyone was just devastated, like, it was just... Just like we're just walking around and thinking, you know, what, what, you know, it's just... And just trying to work out, you know, why, why, what happened, you know, and... And there's no way, you know... I think there's no way he would have just went out there... Put it, you know, went out on the tracks by himself. It wasn't him. He was a happy... Um, happy boy. And he's just taken like that and, and nobody tries to get to the bottom of it. And, you know, you, families don't move on. You sometimes hear police and politicians say, well, it's 28 years, you should just move on. Nobody moves on from having their son killed. Nobody. Mark's family's heartbreaking journey for answers looks likely to continue. But one thing is for sure, Mark's memory will never fade while they continue to seek the truth. We ain't gonna go quietly in the night like Mark did, but he didn't go quietly. He would have put up a fight. And I tell you what, if you're out there, if you're still out there, get ready for a bigger fight. After everything I've seen and heard in Mark's case, I truly believe he was killed and by more than one person. The fact of the matter is the injury Mark had on his brain is often only sustained by assault victims. That's a telling sign. And what about Mark's blood? There was none at the scene, which says to me that he was dead when he was actually placed there. And that towel that was underneath Mark's head, the one that the police lost, well, I think that the perpetrators had wrapped that around Mark's head to stop the bleeding before he was brought out here. The strange position of Mark's body and the lack of mud on his clothes despite the heavy rains from the night before raises more questions. 
I think Mark was bashed by two local thugs over his plans to go and knock off some marijuana crops from a nearby plantation. I believe that that bashing went too far and Mark ended up dead. I think that those men then placed him on the train tracks and tried to make it look like suicide. The two men who I think bashed Mark on that night still live locally. And speaking with witnesses in the case, they are still absolutely terrified of speaking out for fear of violent retribution from these men. Mark was loved. He was a popular, talented 17-year-old with the world at his feet before it was violently stolen from him. His family deserve answers and they deserve better treatment from the police. Someone somewhere knows something. All we can hope for is that they will come forward because Mark's life mattered. Mark deserves justice. NITV requested a response from the Oxley Local Area Command regarding the claims made in this program. New South Wales Police have issued a statement saying that they continue to investigate the death of Mark Haynes and have urged anyone with any information regarding his case to please call Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. Thanks for watching. I'd love to read any thoughts you have on this case below. And remember to subscribe for more murder, mystery and mayhem. Until next time.